There's actually many verses in the Srimad Bhagavatam. The, ta- the topic is time. T-I-M-E or Kala, time. So this verse is from the 30th chapter of the third canto, first verse. And Krishna is speaking. He says, as a mass of clouds does not know the powerful influence of the wind, a person engaged in material consciousness does not know the powerful strength of the time factor by which he is being carried. (laughs) Purport. The great politician pundit named Chanaka said that even one moment of time cannot be returned even if one is prepared to pay millions of dollars. One cannot calculate the amount of loss there is in wasting valuable time. Either materially or spiritually, one should be very alert in utilizing the time which he has at his disposal. A conditioned soul lives in a particular body for a fixed measurement of time. And it is recommended in the scriptures that within that small measurement of time, one has to finish Krishna consciousness and thus gain relief from the influence of the time factor. But, unfortunately, those who are not in Krishna consciousness are carried away by the strong power of time without their knowledge, as clouds are carried away by the wind. So, how imperceptible time is. Time is a very interesting Subject. I think many years ago I came across this um, compo- compilation of a symposium that was held here. I believe it was in New Delhi many, many, many years ago, back in the 1990s, where great religious, philosophical, and other prominent pe- persons who are great thinkers, were invited, even the Dalai Lama came, to uh, talk about time. (laughs) It was a symposium. It was a five-day event where many people presented papers that they had prepared in months in advance, and there was discussions and various talks about time from different angles. And basically, after reading a lot of it, I, my conclusion was people didn't come to a conclusion. <laughs> Nobody could understand time. <laughs> it's so, what we say, imperceptible. It's mysterious. <laughs> but in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives a little bit of an indication what it is time. He says, it's me. <laughs> he says, Time I am. (laughs) I am time. So that's why it's so hard to understand time, because it's Krishna. (laughs) And Krishna is not so easy to understand. But it's a certain aspect of Krishna's energy, of himself, that is the governing principle of everything in this world. (laughs) It's that factor that brings about develops and gradually diminishes everything in existence. It's moving. It's called time is imperceptible because it just keeps moving. No one can see how time is actually moving, but it's moving. We look on the wall and we see a clock, or we look on our wrist, we see a watch, or we have various ways to measure time, but this is not time. These are measurements of the indication of the element of time. But time is something completely different. It's a feature, in fact, in Bhagavad Gita, one of the main subjects is Kala. (laughs) It's one of the main subjects, how important it is, and Krishna talks about that. And he says, Mritya Sarva Harasya Aham. (laughs) Mrityava. He says, I am time in the form of or I am death in the form of time. <laughs> that everything is moving in that direction. This is the nature of this. And how valuable t- 
time is. It's like, what do we consider valuable in this world? Our positions in society, our relationships with our friends and family members, our wealth, or even our own bodies. We consider these things as valuable. And that's natural. That's human. But we see that, especially... Uh, in the terms, using the analogy of wealth, sometimes people say time is money, right? That the businessman thinks like that. How much time I have and how much money I can make within that time. So he's rushing to increase his amount of money in the time. But we see that time, time is more than money because money, you can get it, you can lose it, you can get it again. <laughs> you can lose it again. <laughs> but time goes in one direction. <laughs> it just keeps moving and it's becoming less and less. Yeah. So in the Bhagavatam it says, with the rising and the setting of the sun, uh, the duration of life is being diminished. Except, here's the, here's the, the clincher, Except for one who engages in hearing the pastimes of the all good, all good personality of Godhead. So time is an element of the material energy. And it's really what we say precious. And the word precious has a certain element of value to it that it makes it more, uh, what we say, valuable than just money because something precious you want to use the be- in the best possible way you want to protect it you want to um, take the best advantage of it so using our time means to use our time for what time is meant to be used for <laughs> so that goes back to the purpose of existence that this material life is simply a sojourn which is one of many sojourns in our advancement, hopefully advancement, towards the supreme goal of life. Therefore, to use time in that way means to use time in the best possible way. (laughs) Unfortunately, people don't see either the value of time or the value of achieving the benefit of using time, either one. And therefore, people waste time. So we might even say that using time in order to facilitate or to accumulate or to establish our material life is a waste of time. Now, that's a very strong statement. Why is that? Because whatever is done materially is lost in the same way. Nothing can be kept. Time takes away everything. So that's what this verse is saying, that from the benefit of time is not to use it for something that you're going to lose in the the long run. Now, people in the material world see, or people who have material consciousness see that this life is all in all and my success of life is to somehow or other use time to get and to enjoy as much as possible. But that getting will eventually make one lose. So, therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam says that what's the value of gaining so many material things if you're going to lose your soul? <laughs> what is the value of uh, you know, a long duration of life? Even if one has more time, we say, maybe we say, uh, comparatively than another individual. Now, people, if people live to 100 years, they think, wow, that's really pretty good, right? <laughs> Let's have a long life, right? And people want that. They want to live as long as possible. So there's so much emphasis on health and self-preservation 
and so many other aspects of, you know, fortifying the duration of life. But the Bhagavatam says that the trees live for thousands of years. And Prabhupada said there's one tree, and he, he makes this point quite often in his lectures, there's one tree, it's the sequoia tree and the redwood tree. These are two trees in California and America that live from between 5,000 and 7, they can live up to 7,000 years. That means some of them may even been here when Krishna was here. <laughs> So that's a long time. <laughs> Even if they live two or three thousand years, that's amazingly long. No one even can calculate, you know, what a tree can experience in three thousand years. <laughs> it's seen so much. But what is the value of a tree life? <laughs> it's it's very little value in that sense, because a tree cannot achieve the goal of life. Therefore, it is simply a type of punishment for the soul living in that body just to expend that amount of time and then get another body and continue in this material world. So one might think, well, to live two or three thousand years, that's nice. But trees do that, some trees. So it's not the duration of life that makes the quality of life, you know, successful. It's what we do with time. (laughs) It's what we do with time. This is the most important part. And Prabhupada would say, you know, Jesus Christ, the great proponent of the Christian religion, he lived 33 years, I think. 32, 33 years. Not very long, that's short. Sri Krishna Chaitanya Mahaprabhu manifested himself. He was only here for 48 years. That's not long. And there are many other great saints. I remember one saint from France. Her name is Saint Teresa of Lassoux. She attained a God, pure God consciousness at the age of 23. And she left her body at that same age. So the value of time is the quality that we put into achieving the purpose of the human form of life and not so much duration. Um, Duration is there, but sometimes we see even if people live very long, such as 80 or 90 or 100 years, that that existence in that body is not very nice, right? Many, most of you are young. There's a few old people here, (laughs) by calculation. Uh, But we see that when you're young, you don't really understand the misery of old age. (laughs) It's just natural because the experience is forgotten from previous lives. But if you ask an old person, you'll see that, you know, the body breaks down and things don't work the way they used to. And it takes great efforts to do what was normally quite easy and routine at a younger age, just to do the basic things. Sometimes eating or sleeping or walking or hearing or seeing, it's not so easy when you get old. So, therefore, duration really doesn't give quality to the life. It is, it is the activities And therefore, the Srimad Bhagavatam explains that one should use every moment of life to achieve the goal of life. And as this this verse from the Srimad Bhagavatam, it says here, I'll read it. By rising and setting of the sun decreases the duration of life of everyone, except, it's a good word, except one who utilizes the time by discussing the activities of the all-good personality of Godhead. So Prabhupada's purport, he says, this verse confirms the great importance of utilizing the human form of life to realize our lost relationship with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Sometimes we say youth is an intoxication. (laughs) Why is that? Because one who's thinking they're young thinks, well, I have so much time, I have so many plans, I have so many this and that. And there is a certain, what we say, lack of understanding the value of time when one is young. 
or even the purpose of life because one has strong desires to enjoy at the, at the young age. Bhagavatam says between the age of 18 and 32 is called the Yadnava Yovanam stage of life for the conditioned soul and the senses are very strong at that age and one wants to experience as much happiness or as much success as possible during those years of life. Um, well, that is natural, but one forgets. Srimad Bhagavatam describes Prahlad Maharaj. Prahlad Maharaj describes that he's speaking to his schoolmates who are of his same age. They're five-year-old boys. He's in the Guru Kul. He wants to instruct them in the purpose of the human form of life. They're sons of demons. His father was a demon, Arani Kashipui. So his associates were also young boys of, who had demon fathers. They were in the same school. It wasn't actually Gurukul, it was Asurakul. It's a little, little, little different. The presence of Prahlad made it somewhat of a Gurukul, but it was an Asur. So he was instructing his, his classmates that, you know, it's explained that, you know, if you just, when you, why don't you become Krishna conscious? And they said, yeah, Pallad, we agree with you because his preaching was so effective. But they said, but still, we're kids and we want to have fun. <coughs> Excuse me, we want to play. We want to enjoy life. And so, you know, when we get old, we can't, do so many things, then maybe we'll take up Krishna conscious. <coughs> Excuse me. And Prahlad was explaining that old means what? He explains old means just before you die. <laughs> that was his response. And no one knows when the duration of life will end. This is the great mystery of the time factor. That I mean, this people don't like to hear this, especially those who are have plans for material life. It says that if you really want to be successful in material life, forget about death, because <laughs> you can't really make your plans effective. <laughs> right? If you're thinking about death and you have all these plans to do things, to enjoy, to to you know experience. How are you going to really remain enthusiastic about your material life? But it says the opposite. If you really, if you're interested in spiritual life, if you're on the path of spiritual life, one should one should keep that principle in the for, forefront. That time could end my duration of life at any time. So therefore, let me be what we say intelligent to use every moment I can to achieve what we say the goal of life. His Holiness Bhakti Tirtha Swami Maharaj, of course he left the world in 2005, and he left, before he left, he wrote this book describing all the elements of giving up the so-called attachments of this material world and how the conditioned soul struggles with these different types of attachments. But the topic of the book, or the title of the book, was Die Before Dying. <laughs> so what he was saying is die to your material desires, and then that prepares you for the time when you will leave the body. Because if we leave the body still with attachments to this material world, that means we have to again enter into another body and do the whole thing again. That means we have to take births and we have diapers to change and we, you know, so many hours. We, our mother has to feed us and chastise us. We have to go to school and learn one and one is two again. <laughs> you know, it's starting all over. The, it's, it's, you know, it's just like everything is erased from the previous life and you're back to zero again. That's what material life is like. So the, the Bhagavatam says, Tasyaito heito pratite na kovito, la labyute ta brahmatamu paryata, ta labyute dukan anya sukam, kalena sarvatram gambira ramhasa. That, uh, 
one who is actually understanding philosophically and has good intelligence doesn't really try to make a permanent position anywhere. Anywhere, from the highest planet to the, in the material world down to the lowest, Krishna says they're all miserable and they're all places of death. There's one story that our, His Divine Grace Srila Prabhupada would repeat quite often, which I thought is interesting. There was a sage, his name was Lomasa Muni. Now Lomasa Muni was fortunate in that he was blessed with the benediction that for every hair on his head he would live the duration of one life of Brahma. Now that's a long time. <laughs> and the scriptures say the life of Brahma is 311 trillion 40 billion years. Now, and the, the, the explanation was he was a very hairy sage. <laughs> So he had a long time to be around. <laughs> so, but he used to live on the bank of the Ganga and do his bhajan. And he lived very simply. He lived by begging. He had nothing. He had some followers who would come. He would speak to them. And But his followers were thinking that, you know, our Guru Maharaj doesn't have a place to live. <laughs> Maybe we should build him a cottage. Something. So they requested that from him. And he said to them, don't bother, I'm not going to be here that long. <laughs> that was his response. Don't bother, I'm not going to be here that long. So if we look at our life in respect to eternal time, eternal time means that force that is constantly existing. It's like you couldn't even measure there's no measurement for our life. It's so insignificant that there's not a small enough way to indicate it. <laughs> life is so fast. It's like a flash. And people, people thinking, well, you know, I'm young. I got so much time. I got so many plans. But it's so fast. And we see, maybe for those of us who are a little bit older, we see, when we look, we can just reflect back in our early days, we just see, it seems like not so long ago. We were going to school, we were doing this, planning this, and now it's all over. <laughs> so, it, our life is so short, it's really inconceivably short. So, and the way we live today, unfortunately, is that we're, increase, we're decreasing the, per, the uh, duration of life just by the way we live, with pollution and so many other ways of lifestyles, you know, creating so many problems. Prabhupada said, now you, you can die by traffic accident. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Plane accident, train accident, this accident. We've, com we've created such great technological and industrial creations in order to move fast across the world, but we've also increased the possibility of death at the same time. Right? They say if you want to be happily, live locally. <laughs> I travel a lot because I'm ha I have to, <laughs> and that's my service. And I see people travel more and more nowadays, right? The trains are full, the planes are full, the buses are full, the car, the roads are full. And where are people going? <laughs> I don't even know where they're going. <laughs> you see little kids with their mothers and young ladies are traveling all over the world. But the, the scriptures say that if you want to be happy, live locally. <laughs> Get your food locally. Get everything you need in the local area. Now we've become a global village. I just like in America now. You know, we have all these big tra trucks who are transporting food from different places in America that have been shipped in from China. <laughs> so you get products and even food outside of the country coming from 10, 20,000 miles away. 
such grand arrangements just to just to eat or just to get some new gadget. There was one group of Italians. They were really wanted to sell some product that they had just invented. I forgot exactly what it was. So they wrote on it, made in China. <laughs> they made it in Italy, but, but they thought if they put made in China, then people would buy it more. <laughs> so it has a reputation, right? So, you know, nowadays we don't live. And it says that, this, this, they say, if you want to be happy, there's three things. Live locally, don't have any debts, and eat home-cooked food. <laughs> How many people are doing that? Right? People are in debt. Right? They 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 live globally or even nationally, and restaurants are so big. Right? The average American eats home once a week. Once a week, because it's such a high energy society where people are always working and doing things and going here and doing that and so many things. And therefore the health, mental, physical health is being reduced and like that. So wasting time simply, you know, doing the same things you could do in, the, in your own area if with a little planning and a little intelligence like that. So we waste so much time and it's so valuable. Prabhupada would, sh- would somehow, he would, he would be giving a class. He did this one, he did this a few times, but one I can remember. He stopped the class, he says, now it is 7.25 a.m. And then he waited a little bit, and he says, now it is 7.26 a.m. So where is 7.25 a.m. December 24th, 1974? Where is it? (laughs) It's gone. So he would make that point that, you know, time is so valuable. And he would always quote Chanaka, saying that you can't buy back time even for millions. Krarapati. You can't. Even even if you own the whole world, you can't buy time back. There's one story where one, Prabhupada also speaks this, how one man is, he's very rich and he has a lot of plans, but somehow he gets afflicted by terminal disease and he's dying. And he says to the doctor, doctor, please give me some more time. I have some plans, I've been unfulfilled. I'll give you so much money if you give me four more years, that's all. He's begging the doctor for more time, <laughs> as if the doctor was the supreme personality. Of <laughs> <laughs> uh, but what can the doctor do? He think the doctor may think I can do it, but it says, uh, you know, Rake Krishna more ke more Krishna Rake ke. <laughs> if Krishna wants you to go, there's nothing going to stop you from going. <laughs> if Krishna wants you to stay, nobody can make you go. <laughs> That's the all-powerful Supreme Personality of Godhead's relationship with the living entities. So people want to use more time in order to facilitate their material existence. But even in that sense, no one can buy any time like that. And time element is represented by death. And Prabhupada says, no one has defeated Yamaraj except one person. <laughs> Her name was Savitri. You know the story, Savitri and Sattavan? Yeah. Savitri was a very chaste and very uh, devoted lady. And she fell in love with this one person named Sattavan. And Sattavan and Savitri were due to be married on a particular day. So they went to an astrologer and the astrologer said he wasn't very happy to give his report. He says, Satavan will die on the marriage day. So Prabhupada says, love is blind. <laughs> so they got married every, anyway. And Satavan died. So Yamaraj, he's the lord of death. He comes to take away the conditioned soul. So he's coming to take away Satavan. 
And Savitri, she's there. Now Savitri had this uh, puja where she would worship Yamaraj. And so she's chasing after Yamaraj saying, bring my husband back. And he says, what are you doing? What do you mean, bring me husband? This is, uh, this is you know, I'm Yamaraj, you know, you know, nobody messes with me, you know. <laughs> he's all powerful, he's very powerful. So, but Savitri had prayed and done puja to Yamaraj to get a son. And Yamaraj had granted her that benediction. So when Satavan was being taken by Yamaraj, Savitri said, you can't take my husband because you gave me the benediction of having a son and I don't have a husband. I need that, you know, husband. And Sat- Yamaraj said, that's right, I made a mistake. <laughs> so he returned to Satavan. Because she's a chaste lady, she doesn't marry again. This is chastity. And so Prabhupada said, that's the only one who ever overcame death. <laughs> that one story. And there was another man who was thinking, Yamaraj, he's such a gentleman. And if I just take stool and smear it all over my body, then he won't come and take me away. Because <laughs> he won't go near. So, but Prabhupada said, it didn't work. <laughs> So no one can somehow or other stem the force of time. Time is there. So one who's actually intelligent will want to use time in the best possible way. But but the conditioned soul becomes bewildered by the effects of time. And one thinks, oh, I got time. Prabhupada tells the story of the cow dung. There's two kinds of cow dung. The wet cow dung and the dry cow dung. So the, the the dry goba cow dung, he's made into a patty and he's being put into the fire, and the wet cow dung is laughing, ha ha ha, you're going into the fire. <laughs> but then again, the wet cow dung doesn't know that soon he'll also dry up. <laughs> It'll be his turn. So that this is, you know, the bewilderment of the time factor that one thinks, yeah, it's not me, it's somebody else, right? That's what Yamaraj or Yudhisthira, Yudhisthira is called Dhammaraj. When Yudhisthira was asked by the Yaksha, Yaksha was in, in the form of, uh, it was his father, actually Yamaraj, who took the form of a Yaksha and was questioning Yama, uh, Yudhisthira. It's a beautiful story in the Mahabharata how the Pandavas died by drinking this water of this one lake when they were so thirsty after being warned by this yaksha not to drink the water. All the Pandavas had died except Yudhisthira. Yudhisthira was also in the same condition. When he was about to drink the water, the, the yaksha spoke to him, told him, if you t- drink the water, you will also die. Somehow he restrained himself. And after restraining himself, the yaksha said, now I have some questions. Can you answer? He gave him 50 questions. 50. This is nicely explained in his Mahabharata. And the last question, out of all the 50 questions, he says, what is the most amazing thing in this world? (laughs) That was the last of all questions. And Yudhisthira was very intelligent. And he said, the most amazing thing in this world is that everyone is seeing my friends, my family members and others dying. And they're thinking, not me. (laughs) It happens to somebody else. (laughs) It just doesn't happen to me. Why does the, why does the, why does the, why does a person think like that? Why? Because death is foreign to the soul. We intuitively, we know, we don't die. That's a fact. We know that. That's why when the idea of death comes, it sounds like it's, it's something that is not for me. It's not for you. It's for your body. But therefore, that, that idea that I'm not going to die is both foolish and intuitively correct. Because in the, in the real sense... 
the soul is eternal. The hanyate, hanyamani, sarire, that the body dies, but the soul is eternal. And actually, the body doesn't die because it's never alive. If something is never alive, how can it die? You might say, well, what is Maharaj talking about now? (laughs) What do you mean the body is never alive? It's a fact. The body is simply a combination of material elements. Bhumir apanalobayu kamana buddhiyevacha ahankar itiyame bina prakriti astada. Krishna explains in Bhagavad Gita, earth, water, fire, air, mind, intelligence, and false ego. These make up the entire creative material existence. So our bodies are made out of these combinations of these elements in different proportions. But these elements have no life. They're not, they're simply dead matter. What gives life to the body is the soul. And so when the soul is in the body, the body's alive. Or it looks like it. <laughs> but it's not. It's just moving because there's a life force that's pushing this body in different ways. It's like I explained. Sometimes when we preach in jail, we have to preach very simply especially in Western countries, because people really don't understand philosophy at all. So we tell them, um, do you see with your eyes? They say, yeah, yeah, I see with my eyes. We say, no, you don't see with your eyes. We say, no, we actually say, do, do the eyes see? That's the question. Do the eyes see? And they say, yeah, the eyes see. No, the eyes don't see, you see. But you're using your eyes to see. So it's you who are seeing, and the eyes are the instruments for sight. The ear is the instrument for hearing, but it's you who is hearing. If there's nobody home, then nothing happens. (laughs) The eyes, the ears, are it's just like, you know, nothing nothing occurs, even when you're sleeping, right? You can't take in sensory uh, perception, nor can you just respond out. You're on a subtle platform. So the body is simply a combination of material elements very nicely constructed by Lord Brahma under the agency, under the direction of Lord Krishna to simply facilitate our sojourn in this material world. Therefore, death is unnatural for the soul because the soul never takes birth and never dies. And if we can understand that, then we'll be able to use our time for what it's meant to be. Simply to facilitate the the needs of the body beyond what is required in order to live is shrama evihi kevalam. It's called useless waste of time. Therefore, life should be molded in such a way that one can use maximum amount of time for hearing and chanting and serving the all-good personality of Godhead. That's the benefit of human form of life. And to take care of the body can be done very easily. A little food, a place to stay, some family members, some care, little... It doesn't take much to maintain the body. Of course, now, now more than ever in today's society, they're making bodily maintenance more like bodily display, decorations. You got to have nice suits, nice cars, nice everything, right? You got to look nice because if you don't look nice, nobody will like you. (laughs) You have to present yourself in a very way so you can be acceptable by modern technological industrial society, right? But eating is eating, sleeping is sleeping, you know, some clothes are there. Therefore, simple living facilitates the use of our time to live simply. Now it's, it's, now it's, it's, it's simply impossible to live. <laughs> what to speak about living simply? It's so difficult, right? It's like, you know, I was, Last night we were coming home from, back from Wada Farm, and uh, uh, it was a traffic jam. 
traffic jam. So we were sitting in traffic and it was so jammed up, there was one bridge that was only one way going one way. It's just right outside of Bombay. And we were sitting there for about an hour, waiting, just sitting. And I was thinking, advancement of civilization. <laughs> we can sit in our cars and just be miserable. <laughs> Fortunately, we were chanting. So the modern materialistic society has complicated the basic activities of life in such a way that people are spending so much time just for the, just to facilitate the needs. And therefore, it's, there's no, now we find less and less time, or we have to really work in order to create time for spiritual life. But if we don't, then we'll find that whatever time we use simply to maintain this body doesn't give us any satisfaction and takes away from the real goal of life. So, therefore, hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord brings the soul to the transcendental platform where one f- doesn't see the, what we say, the sufferings that come by way of existence in this material world. Time has no... This is another way to become what we say... Obliv- people are oblivious to time in the wrong way. But the devotee doesn't think about time because time becomes inconspicuous by his absence. Why? Because when one is engaged in devotional service of the Lord, one transcends the effects of time. One is no longer under the influence of material time, but is under the influence of the spiritual energy, which is not affected by the influence of time. Just like a person who is Krishna conscious in their life, what do they do? They hear and chant the glories of the Lord, they serve the Lord, they associate with others, devotees doing the same, and when they die, they do the same thing. <laughs> and they go on to another situation to continue the same activities. So death, for one who is engaged in devotional service, is a stepping stone towards eternal life or to a better situation of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. So therefore, the time factor has no influence upon the devotee, nor does the devotee worry about these things. They simply, the only anxiety a devotee has is not to waste time with activities that are useless like that. Because time is precious. Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasaya says, time is precious. But people are so attached nowadays. Right? Prabhupada tells the story of Kailash. You know the story of Kailash? Yeah, you've heard that story? Kailash. How many have heard the story of Kailash? Wow, you're all educated. In... <laughs> this is a very interesting story. Kailash and the snake. Kailash was a businessman. He had a big family. And he was on in years. Somehow, by the grace of the Lord, he met Sri Narada Muni. And Narada Muni really attracted his mind to devotional service. He wanted to become a devotee, but he had a lot of material activities going for him. He was a big businessman, a lot of plans. So Narada would preach to him and say, Kailash, come on, why don't you just give it all up and become a devotee? And but he would say, you know, what can I, but my, I have to teach my children. They're going to take over the business. I'm their father. If I don't teach them, then they, how are they going to learn? So Narada went away. After some time, Narada comes back and Kailash is there. He says, Kailash, are you ready now? Uh, Kailash just says, well, you know, my kids are grown up and now they're taking over the business. But they have children now. But, you know, they don't know how to raise their children. I have to teach them. I am their grandfather. That's my responsibility. So Narada leaves. And after some time he comes back. And he comes in the house. The family members are there. He says, where's Kailash? He said, oh, our grandfather, he died. And Narada feeling, oh, so bad. So he goes away. He's walking out, and while he's walking out, he hears, Psst, hey, Narada, psst. He's looking around, and he sees 
this dog, the dog starts to speak to him and says, I'm Kailash. I became a dog. Narada says, are you ready now? He said, well, you know, somebody has to guard the house. <laughs> I'm, I'm the guard dog. <laughs> so, so Narada gets disgusted and leaves. So after some time he decides, let me go back and just see how that dog is doing. So he goes back and he's looking around for the dog. He can't find the dog. Goes into the house, asks the family members, what happened to that dog you had out there? Oh, he died. Lord is feeling bad. So he walks out, he's going out, and he hears, Psst, hey, Narada, over here. Narada's looking, he doesn't see anything. And he's, over here in the bushes, it's me, Kailash, I'm a snake. <laughs> and he says, oh, and Narada says, are you ready now? Well, the snake, who was Kailash, said, well, you know, the dog died, <laughs> and I have to take care of the house, nobody's guarding it. So Narada thinks, all right. I have to do something to help this person along. That's the duty of the guru, right? Give a little push. So he goes into the house. He says to the family members, you know you have a snake in your yard? They said, a snake? Oh, let's get some sticks. (laughs) So they get some sticks and they're out there beating the snake and they're beating their grandfather, you know, Kailash. So Narada says, are you ready now, Kailash? (laughs) He says, yeah, I'm ready. (laughs) So we get so attached to our material situation, we don't want to move. You know, but time pushes us out. I told that story to a whole group of new people who I never met. And at the end, after the class was over, one man came up to me, looked really, really painful expression on his face. I said, what's the matter? He said, my name's Kailash. <laughs> <laughs> So I said, I guess the story was for you. (laughs) That's all I said. He wasn't so happy to hear that either. (laughs) So we don't want to be Kailash or somebody like that. We have to take care of our material responsibilities, but do it in such a way that it, it becomes supportive to our main goal in life. That's why Krishna says, you know, make devotional service the supreme goal in life and whatever else you do will be an extension of your devotional service and not an impediment towards your spiritual life. Yat karosi aranasi yat jahosi dadasi yat yatapasi dakunti yat mat kurusho arpanam. Krishna instructs us very strongly we should very carefully make sure that we ever, whatever we do it's done as an offering to the Lord. And if we carefully study the Shastras, and this is confirmed by all the spiritual masters, what do we have that is ours? Gorgopal Prabhu, who gave class this morning, Srimad Bhagavatam, he explained this point, and I thought it was very interesting. There's nothing we have except one thing. It's called independence. That's all. We have nothing. This material energy belongs to Krishna. The body we have belongs to Krishna. Everything belongs to somebody else. (laughs) The only thing we have that we can call our own is our freedom of choice. That's it. And that choice, when it's used for devotional service, means that one has chosen what we say eternal life over this life of fearfulness because one who want the time factor creates fear in the hearts and minds of everyone oh you know will I have time will time come along time is fearful but for a devotee time is Krishna <laughs> time is Krishna okay so time there's, there's a lot to be said on this point and the shastras are full. And despite all the symposiums and all the, the philosophies and all that, no one can understand time because time is Krishna. And one who takes shelter of Krishna is no longer under the influence of material time, but it enters into the eternal time, which is the nature of the soul. It says in the spiritual world, there's no time. <laughs> Time is conspicuous, the word is conspicuous by its absence. Things are always the present. 
Of course, there's a there's a indication of time as Krishna goes through his various activities through, throughout the day, his different leelas. And this time factor is not the time factor of the material sense. It's the spiritual time factor which enhances the, the variety and the joyfulness of the various activities of Krishna's pastimes with his devotees. That spiritual time. And that is always in the element of the present. But it appears to have past and future. It's only appearance in order to facilitate Krishna's transcendental leelas. And that is yoga maya in the spiritual world. But the material time factor is completely different. And that's Krishna as death personified. Okay, thank you. Srila Prabhupada ki jai Sri Hari Nam Sankirtan ki jai Gaur Premanandi Hari Hari Go Hare Krishna I was just informed there's time for questions. If Is there any questions? Don't ask the question, how long am I going to live? Because I can't answer that one. <laughs> any questions? <laughs> okay. No questions. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What's next? Mm-hmm. Kirtan. Jaya. There's always time for kirtan. <laughs>